The following movie has been rated R by the Motion Picture Association of America. It is intended for mature audiences. Parents may wish to consider whether it should be viewed by children under 17. I love movies, but sometimes I love trailers even more. Trailers get me excited. They get me into the theater. And when I was younger, that red restricted warning would come up, and I knew that this movie, in one way or another, was not going to hold anything back. Rated R meant violence, it meant nudity, and it felt dangerous. It's funny to think about it, but it's true, like a content warning that listed violence, drug use, nudity, and strong sexual sequences, well, that lineup had me up late at night watching some of the worst movies. <laughs> You're listening to the new episode of In Love With The Process. I'm your host, Mike Petchy. And the other day I was thinking, who are the folks that actually rate movies? Who is this association that holds the box office fate of so many films in the power of granting one of these simple letters? G, P, G, R, and the dangerous NC-17. As I get closer to directing my first major film, uh, I have to ask myself these questions. The difference between an R and a PG-13 can equal millions in the box office. And what makes a scene more violent than the next? And if I say fuck in a movie, does that give it an R? And shit, what if a scene calls for a fully nude man or woman? At what point do I get an NC-17? The fucking truth is, is that I don't know shit about how the rating system works. And thankfully, today's guest can give me the answers I need. We're talking with Barry Freeman, now, Barry spent 10 years on the MPAA ratings board, and I'm sure he's seen his fair share of a lot of dirty films, um, but now he serves as a consultant to young filmmakers that are trying to get their films put through, um, because there's a whole process involved that I don't know anything about, guys. Um, he was also featured in the film, This Film Is Not Yet Rated, which digs in deep into the rating system and really kind of shines a negative light on the MPAA in general. Um, that's not my goal today. I don't, I'm not here to pass judgment. I'm not here to give an opinion on how films are rated. I just want to understand how it all works. So I want to take a second here, guys, and give a quick technical disclaimer. So the only way to get Barry on the show was through Skype. And normally what I try to do is record on both ends of it, but this time I just had to go with what it is. Um, and so sometimes he drops in and out, but the conversation is so fascinating to me. Um, and I hope it is for you too. So I think you guys will get through that stuff pretty quick. You know me, I try to make everything technically perfect, but every once in a while, you just gotta say, fuck it, right? Okay, anyway, enough gabbing. So if you're as curious as I am about the rating system, and you wanna learn a little bit about what makes a movie R, or what makes a movie NC-17, then I suggest you sit back, relax, and enjoy the new episode of In Love With The Process. Thanks for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Hey, my pleasure, Mike. It's always great to talk to a fellow Bostonian as well. I, you know, I had no idea that you were from Boston, so finding that out was just this extra extra frosting on the cake. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> well, you know, I've been out here in L.A. since 95, but once a Bostonian, always a Bostonian. <laughs> so um, I was just telling my audience about uh, the MPAA and uh, how little – I actually think about who they are and what it is they do and how much of an effect that they actually have on the film industry and how important it is to learn a little bit about this. And I figured that you're the man to talk to. Um, we had briefly talked about this online and you told me about what you do, but why don't I just let you explain to the audience exactly what it is that you do? Absolutely, Mike. And thanks for having me on today. I appreciate it. Sure. So... I came out to California in 95. I had no business in entertainment, uh, strictly project management, new sales, new business development. And there was an opportunity at the Motion Picture Association of America, the MPAA, where they were looking for a raider, somebody to sit and watch three movies a day, take notes, talk about it, and just watch movies endlessly Monday through Friday. And I thought this is fantastic because I was just starting up going to graduate school at night. So I was able to get the job. I was a Raider for about 10 years. And while I was at the MPAA, I noticed that filmmakers seemed pretty frustrated 
either not quite knowing the rules or just needing some help, needing somebody to advocate for their position. So I did this crazy thing and I started calling producers and saying, what if there was somebody like me out there who could help you out, go through the whole ratings process because there's amazing box office potential for an example between PG-13 and R, where if the filmmaker can make a PG-13, there's more box office potential and a lot of other issues to get through the whole process of getting your film rated. So this turned into a business, and here I am today speaking with you. Okay, well, that's cool, man. And that actually will uh, start to trigger some of my questions because for me, when I think of the MPAA, I, I, it's really just, honestly, it's that logo that shows up before trailers. So whether or not the movie's uh, approved for general audiences or if the movie's approved for restricted audiences, I never really even processed that organization other than, and you know, I don't know how many times I've actually looked at that logo and it just hasn't sunk in. Um, so I'm curious and, you know, talk about what you can and obviously let me know what you can't talk about, but I don't even know their process there. Do they look for volunteers and do those volunteer, are, are they volunteers that do all the ratings for it or are they paid positions? Like what kind of stuff can you talk about? Oh, sure, Mike. I, I could talk about the things that are commonly known that are maybe on the website or discussed in articles. So the MPAA is the Motion Picture Association of America. Their, uh, their headquarters is in Sherman Oaks, California, you know, just outside of L.A. And they also have offices all around the world, including a large contingent in Washington. And huh. the MPAA is not just ratings. They deal with all types of issues that advocate for filmmakers but a large part of their uh, their makeup is to fight piracy, to protect filmmakers' rights, not just in the U.S., but all around the world. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, so the ratings board is just a part of the MPAA, and it's actually, the actual department is CARA, C-A-R-A, which is the Classification and Rating Administration. So they're, they're just one department. There's title and registration. There's advertising piracy and several others so they're just one part of a of a, you know a major company and they advocate for the major studios and also for independent filmmakers uh, as far as the people who work on the ratings board it definitely is a paid position mm -hmm. don't really advertise it because i think if they did they would get thousands of resumes <laughs> and they yeah they may have done it at one time but it is a paid position i believe that part of it is uh, confidential, and there are, I believe there are uh, there are full time positions there and part time positions on the ratings board, and that's about as into it as I can get as far as the raters. Uh, one thing that they do try to do is they try to uh, field a, a wide demographic on their ratings board, so they want males, females, different types of past vocations. Uh, preferably different political leanings. They just try to get a cross-section of uh, various people around the country. And I actually think they do that fairly well. So it's such an interesting position to take. Um, and, and, you know, looking for your personal experience on this, it must be fascinating to sit, actually your job is that you sit down and you watch a ton of movies. Like, does did that change the way that you watch films and see films? Are you When you do these things, were you personally just examining technique and ex examining voice and tone or were you watching them just as movies and then passing your judgment afterwards that's it's such a weird thing to me yeah from a non-ratings perspective mike one thing that i did learn because the the hollywood formulaic model uh, i'm not into those movies at all so the two movies i really the two genres of movie i really learned to appreciate uh were in our documentaries and foreign films and if those that are listening that have Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and the others, if you can look at like the top 10 foreign films and check some of those out, if you can stand to, to read subtitles and also documentaries, those are two genres that have tremendous amount of great quality. And I highly recommend to, to really take a good look at, give them a try. Uh, as far as what I did when I first came into the MPAA, uh, I enjoyed movies, but I wasn't really a movie buff. So just try to do is observe all the other raters around me. You know, I read the guide to like the basic idea on rating elements and where they fall into the categories. 
And uh, I think the important thing as a rater is basically uh, anybody can give a, a, a rating of PG or PG-13 and most of the time probably be on target. But it's important to be able to use common sense. And, and if you agree uh, with a particular rating or a descriptor of a rating, it's important to be able to, you know, make a decent uh, argument for, you know, for what you're uh, fighting for. Now, do do multiple people uh, watch uh, a single film, or is it just like one raider that gets assigned a, a movie? It's never one raider per movie. They they what they do is they um, they sometimes they'll they may split uh, the screening, but uh, most often there's the full number of uh, rating members that watch a movie together. What they do is. Uh, they take notes, detailed notes throughout the movie, you know, as a clipboard and a light. Uh-huh. And after the movie, there's a silent vote. So in other words, they don't discuss before they vote, so they don't sway each other's opinions. And then there's, there's discussion uh, once the ballots are collected. So it, it's the type of thing where uh, if somebody's having a bad day and they're not paying attention to a movie or, that you know, it's a Friday afternoon and they're exhausted from the week, uh, one person that might be off a little bit, uh, that won't happen. So they're, they're taking a group effort, and it's basically majority vote for the rating. Fascinating. So the first thing that pops into my head, you know, it's almost like jury duty <laughs> to a certain extent. Is it like a is it like a, a mixed panel? Is it like are you in a room with like a bit of everything, like a, like a mom and like, you know, a person from a certain background? And, you know, like is it mixed or can you talk about that? It is. Without giving specific information, absolutely, Mike. What they try to do is uh, they try to have a mixture of gender and race and maybe even uh, geographic location. I mean, when I came in, I was from Boston. They didn't have anybody uh, from the East Coast. I had a business background. I don't believe anybody on the board at the time had my type of business background. And, you know, being from Boston, uh I might have been subjected to a little bit more flavorful language or different <laughs> types of elements that would affect me differently than somebody who was maybe born in L.A. or born in a small town in Kansas. So it is they, they really try to get the demographics uh, a wide range. And like I mentioned, I think they do a good job at that. It's impossible to really say what is, you know, what is the melting pot? How many people do we need for this and for that? But uh, they, they really try to do their best. Fascinating. Okay, so then a bunch of you sit in a room, you watch this film, and then do you guys uh, talk about what your responses are, or do you just hand them in and then they sort of process that and then someone takes a tally of everything and then makes it happen? Like, how does that work? Sure. We have, uh, uh, or I should say they have. I talk we because uh, I've been out for about four years and I still deal with ratings every day, so it's constantly (laughs) in my mind, so pardon me. Uh, They... uh, they collect a private ballot from everybody, and then there's, act- there's discussion on every movie. Now, there may be some movies that are clear-cut, R-rated, everybody agrees. And then the other area where there often needs discussion is the descriptor. And that's what you see on the billboard on the, uh, on the bus sign. It's PG-13 for language, some violence, and thematic elements. So although everybody may be the same for the rating, it's important for the MPAA to let parents know what the most appropriate description is of the film. Uh-huh. So there's a big difference between some PG-13s. There was a really wonderful movie I, I rated when I was uh, early on the board called Whale Rider. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I've heard of it, uh, yes. Yeah, it, it, was, it was as benign a PG-13 as there is. It might have been uh, like uh, some brief drug content and thematic elements. And then there are other movies like maybe some of the Adam Sandler movies that have a description that's as long as the alphabet. It just keeps going and it's full of, you know, crude behavior, sexual content, uh, you know, brief drug use and everything under the sun. So uh, the descriptor is something that uh, maybe a lot of your viewers may not or listeners may not be uh, familiar with. But if you are a parent uh, don't just look at the rating, look at the descriptor, because if your child is sensitive to language or sensitive to, you don't want them seeing some more advanced sexual content, then the descriptor is very helpful. 
<laughs> Unless you were, you know, a kid like me growing up as a, as a teenager going, oh my God, there's nudity in this movie. I'm ready for it. <laughs> I always saw that the descriptors were almost, almost like another log line for the film. Which... You know That's, I, I think the same way. And what's funny is it's like when I, when I heard language out here for the first time and I, you know, the, the, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about, we'll talk about the, uh, the F bomb rule where usually one F F bomb is allowed in PG 13 i am like, from the schoolyards I came from when I was 12 years old, um, this should be PG. Um, so <laughs> Austin, you and I can understand that there are different elements that are sensitive or, you know, more important for parents to be aware of. Oh, for sure. I mean, uh, it's the same. My show is far from uh, PG-13, and I, I've, always, <laughs> I've always used terms like fuck or anything else as descriptors. <laughs> so it's, it's, oh. a, it's an interesting it, – I get – I understand why – and it's good to hear, actually, that it is almost like a jury setup where there are these different people from different uh, backgrounds and different cultures making these decisions. Because um, I think that's important that at least someone has that representation. Is there like a, a set of rules per film or do they just sort of take whoever's available at that time and, and put them through uh, the reading thing? Like, am I assured as a director that I'm going to get like... A, a representation, like a mix, a really good mix of representation for my film, I guess, is my question. Yeah, there's, there's no bias towards a major film versus a very low budget film. Uh, what they typically do is uh, the entire board is watching a film. So depending on who might be absent that day, uh, it, every, every producer can feel comfortable knowing that they're going to get the fair shake, uh, whether they're a small budget or a large uh, budget film. Oh, interesting. Okay, so that I, I wasn't thinking about that. So then it's like one specific board, so there's like a certain amount of folks that are doing it and they're they're watching everything? Is that how that works? Or is there like a pool of, of board members that they're pulling from for whoever's available? It's basically one board, and I believe the website lists the board as anywhere from 8 to 12 members. Okay. I think that's pretty representative. Uh, they're all going to be physically there at, this, at the location in Los Angeles. Nobody's watching this remotely and, and sending in some paperwork. They're all going to be watching it together. They're going to discuss the movie afterwards together. I mean, it's, it's a situation where the producers should feel pretty comfortable that uh, they may not agree with the rating. They may think there are issues with the system, but they're going to get a fair shake as the rating, as the process is set up right now. Wow. Okay. So that's got to be an incredibly tiresome job at that point because you're literally that group of what, 12 or however many are the folks that are just filtering everything that's being made at that point. Like they must have so many submissions a year between uh, uh, independent and like actual movie stuff, you know? There are, Mike. And if you have any uh, filmmakers who are listening in on this, that kind of brings up a point that, that I was hoping to address at some point during our discussion. And that is uh, sometimes there's a tremendous amount of inventory in this backup. So when a filmmaker uh, wants to send in their film to be rated, they can't expect it to happen that week because depending on the inventory, they could be waiting, you know, a month, two months, three months. Wow. Uh, it, it could take a while. So it's important to understand if you are a filmmaker that uh, you have to understand the process. Know the basic 101s. Know what you what you need to get into the MPAA. You need a wire transfer. You need two copies of a screener. You need to be able to fill out the paperwork properly. Uh, there are some basics. It's not hard to understand, but it's important to know before you start the process. So for that first time filmmaker, if you have grand plans for a theatrical release and you want that rating, it's important to either um, get up to snuff by doing your research or you know, call somebody like me who can help you out. Sorry to interrupt, guys, but this seems like a perfect moment for a message from our sponsors. So returning for the second time are our good buddies over at ToneThisPhone.com. So what do we got here? Uh, do you ask yourself, should I spend money on a durable cell phone case? Well, I think you should, and here's why. Smartphone manufacturers and vendors sell an extended warranty that can replace or repair your phone. We know this, right? But the downside is, most of the time, the cost of that warranty is roughly about $80 a year, and it exceeds the cost of doing individual repairs. I mean, I have never used my warranty. 
um, what I do is I just get myself a nice durable cell phone case that protects it every time I drop it like an idiot. Um, and I just keep it away from water. <laughs> so if you don't have a, a really good cell phone case, if you're looking for something cool, something stylish, go shop over at tonethisphone.com and you'll find the best durable and stylish phone cases right now. So like I said, go on over to tonethisphone.com. Okay. Next up is Audible. So today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering all of our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. So if you just go to audibletrial.com backslash in love with the process and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs, download yourself a free trial and start listening. It's that easy. So if you go to audible.com slash in love with the process to get started today. I use it. I'm listening to now. I've been talking about it on a bunch of the other episodes. I'm listening to the sequel to The Shining written by uh, Mr. Stephen King, and it's fantastic. And apparently I'm recording these uh, ads underneath a fucking airport today. Jesus Christ, the technical shit on this episode is pissing me the fuck off. God damn it. Anyway, I appreciate your patience. And uh, head on over to audible.com slash in love with the process. And every time you guys sign up, we get a little bit of loot that helps keep the episode running. So enough of this shit. Let's get back to the fucking show. Thanks, guys. Okay, so let's 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 pretend because you and I have talked about this. I'm in the process now of, of, of getting really close to making a film and like a real like a, a good size film. Um, and so let's pretend like uh, we've gone through the process of cutting. We're, we're getting close to like uh, a, a final edit and I'm, I'm being responsible and I'm sending my film in to be rated as early as I possibly can based around the schedule. Uh, so I submit it. I pay. So what like are the fees ridiculous? Like how does how does that work? Oh, sure. And that's a great question. And one that a lot of filmmakers don't understand ahead of time. And if you're on a tight budget. It can, you know, if you're working off of family credit cards, it's crucial to know this because all those line items add up, as you know, Mike. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the basic deal with the MPAA fees are it's based on the total negative cost of the film. So all of the costs, including marketing and and advertising, uh, they're, they're, it's a category thing. So in other words, if you have a $75 million plus blockbuster and Mike, you in the $75 million range or maybe somewhere south of that? <laughs> no, I'm at like the 160, you know. <laughs> I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get you not to laugh on that one, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the $75 million off the top of my head, the $75 million blockbuster is going to be a $25,000 fee. Hmm. And then it goes all the way down to it could be sub five, uh, 500000 there's a couple of different categories, so there's a there's a little bit more detail there. But you're talking about anywhere from twenty five hundred or three thousand dollars all the way up to the the mega blockbuster of twenty five thousand. Now, just one thing to point out, Mike, is uh, you submit your film and you don't like the rating, or you didn't expect the rating, and you need to make changes and send it back. Is that an additional fee? Uh, it no, it's not. So you're allowed to make changes and send it back, and that's all under the uh, the original fee that you paid. Okay, that's good. That's good. It, the only difference is your your movie hits real big, Mike, and then you decide, I want to show the director's cut with all the blood and the sex and the violence and and tremendous drug use. You can submit that film, but that's going to be treated as a whole separate en entity, whether you change three seconds of the film or you change you know, uh, a full hour of the film. If you submit a film after it's been rated, and uh, you have to change the film title. So it, it would have to be Mike Petchy's project uh, special footage or, edition or anything you want to name it. That That's a separate submission. It's treated just like a separate film. Oh, fascinating. Okay. All right. So then uh, I submit my stuff and uh, turns out that you guys think I, you know, use the F word too many times. Um, and the studio is telling me that I have to make it a PG 13. 
So how long does it take to get, uh, do I get put back in that queue? Or am I waiting three months uh, to get like a, a relook at it? I think it's more of a as schedules permit type of thing. So one thing you want to keep in mind is if you, uh, if you're given some information like uh, this sex scene is, is, uh, is still much too strong for PG-13, but we can't tell you how to make your movie. If you if they're seeing that there are very few changes and you're just nickel and diming, they're not going to continue to look at it over and over again. They're going to let you know you got to make some major moves. We can't keep spending time on this. So you have to move in a in a reasonable fashion if you're making changes and resubmitting. But it is basically on uh, on a scheduling uh, situation. It, interesting. And now, do you guys have to sit down and watch the whole movie again, or do we just send you that specific scene and say this is how it works and this is what's happening? It could work either way. In other words, if you submit. Uh, I've heard some of your spicy language on the other podcasts. So if <laughs> you submit what a, what a Mike Petchy film is in my mind, um, <laughs> then it's 97 F-bombs throughout the film, then the person that's designated to speak with you from the MPA is going to say, I can't really give you seven scenes. There's so much language in here that you're going to have to edit it the way you see fit to get it down to a PG-13. That's something where... It would probably they would probably look at the whole movie. Right. If you have three very specific scenes and you know it's a matter of uh, you know ten seconds here, thirteen seconds there, twenty seconds there, that's the type of thing where they'll look at the specific scenes. So it's it's all uh, on a on a per film basis, each in its own uh, context. Okay. Well, so then let's talk a bit about because um, some of the the listeners may not know this stuff. So what? So the the ratings right now that exist, it's it's G, it's PG, it's PG thirteen, and then it's NC seventeen. Correct? Uh, you're just missing an R in there between PG thirteen and NC seventeen. Of course. Okay. So then, so then there's the R. So G is such a like it's a rare thing to actually see a G movie. Like most of the time, maybe it's like a Disney thing, maybe it's like an animated thing. Like what what is the flipping point for a, a G to a PG? Uh, my opinion is it's very difficult to make a G movie, very difficult, much more so. I mean, the old Bambi, which had quite a bit of violence for a kid's movie, yes. that G back then, if you took a look at it compared to the G's right now, they look like they're, they're like two categories apart. So a G really in today's, uh, ratings process, a G really has to be clean you may be able to get like a darn or a, you know, something that's not even really, you know, not a damn, but like a darn. And some of those like really a little bit of mild language and the violence has to be more like animated fluff. It, it's, it, it's a real fine line to be able to, to receive a G rating. Weird. Okay. So then this brings me back to like you sitting in this room and watching this movie. It's, are you like, do you, do you just have like the checklist in front of you where it's like, okay, here are the words that can't be said. Here's this, like how, because I'll sit and watch a, a G movie and a lot of that stuff will just completely go under my radar and I, it won't even register to me as I'm watching it. So how are you guys staying so vigilant on this? Is it like you're sitting down going, this is my job. This is what I do. Here's the list of things that are not allowed in this movie. And then I'm going with it. Are, are you actually tonally uh, absorbing the movie as you watch it? You know what I mean? I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, several thousand movies into the process, I think there's an automatic pilot switch that happens that says, <laughs> when I see it or when I hear it, I know it, and I have a pretty good idea where it should go. Um, so, I, I mean, as far as uh, uh, what we keep an eye on or what ratings keep an eye on, there are six elements uh, that are ratings worthy, and they're violence, language, sexuality, which includes nudity drug use, smoking, and theme. So anything that's rateable, it's going to be rateable under one of those uh, six categories. So in other words, we're going to keep an eye on any and all of those six elements. And if any of those elements are in the movie, then there'll be at least a PG rating. And then you work, I, you pretty much work your way up from a clean slate of a G. And then as you go along, I mean, you could have a G movie that goes along for quite a while and then bam, some language or a drug use or something. And 
and the ball game changes. Fascinating. Okay. So then back into the rating system here. So we're talking, so the PG 13 rating was something that was relatively new that was created because of Spielberg and, and uh, one of the Indiana Jones movies, I think if I'm correct. That's, on that. Yeah, that that's correct. And, uh, and boy, that's a big gap between PG and R. And I, uh, I personally think it was a very good move to have that PG-13. And now there are advocates for PG-13 to be sliced up into maybe two categories because there's so much more heavier content that's made it into PG-13, especially with violence. So uh, I'm going off on a tangent, but... No, it's a good uh, one. It's a good one. It, yeah, as you ask these questions, it kind of brings up some of the, the points that... Uh, that I bring up or talk with with film students and and filmmakers at festivals is uh, it, it, the the rating system is a pretty fascinating deal and it's changed I think it's changed for the better but there's always room for improvement and it's such a fascinating perspective right because in theory you guys are having the perspective of a, of, a, of a potential parent I mean ultimately that's the purpose of the the rating system is to protect uh, children from these things correct i mean because otherwise who who else like if you're an adult and you, you like it doesn't matter for you correct that's right and, and it's funny because one of my sales pitches when i talk to producers and they, they'll say what well, why should i use you i'll say because the mpaa their stated goal is to let parents know about the suitability of a film for their children and you know my stated goal is to advocate for filmmakers to uh, help them get through the system. And the MPAA is looking out for parents uh, to help out parents in giving them s some type of tool to you know for the appropriateness of film. So uh, that's absolutely true, Mike. Uh, Mike. And it makes sense that you know from what you were saying before, it makes sense that they potentially want to split that PG thirteen category up a bit because I mean that is the make or break for, you know, uh, box office, you know, is between the PG-13 and the R thing, correct? Like that's, I mean, Marvel is essentially trying to keep everything PG-13 because then they make a buku dollars <laughs> off of that. Well, there, were a couple, there were a couple of really well-performing R genres, and one of them is the, is the uh, crude comedy. The, I think it was like Wedding Crashers and 40-Year-Old Virgin. Those type of movies became acceptable to be loaded with, you know, all of the different elements and those are money makers. And so are the, the slasher horror films that, you know, they're so over the top crazy, the saw series and, yeah. and a bunch of those that are so far over the top. Those just don't have a place in PG 13. They're money makers, but on the whole PG 13, uh, out box offices, uh, are by about three and a half or four dollars to one. So if you're if you have a film that can comfortably be in a PG-13 and all you're doing is putting in superfluous language, you have a better chance of higher box office by making it a PG-13. And that's the majority of my living is made off of those the differentiate differentiation between those two categories. Interesting. And then, you know, the violence is a bit more lax because violence is a, uh, socially a bit more accepted these days. And then, I mean, if, if you're talking about like, a comic book movie, you have to have, there has to be a draw, you know, besides the sweet outfit and, you know, maybe Robert Downey Jr.'s in it and everybody's got a crush on him. There has to be the action sequences. There has to be Hulk punching his way through stuff. Um, and dealing with that huge sort of franchise and all the money based behind that franchise and that franchise doing the calculations and going, we have to have a PG-13. It feels like uh, the, the, that the MPA a is just a bit more lax on violence than it is on sex or anything like that, right? You know, that's absolutely the way most filmmakers feel. And I understand that. I do agree that, that the MPA is much more lenient with, uh, with violence than sex. But what's interesting is, and uh, what your listeners, you know, might glean from this conversation is the body counts very high in PG 13. I mean, the body counts on the mission impossible and the James Bond movies they can be off the charts. I mean, I don't know if they're killing 100, 150 people in these films. Uh, <laughs> the difference is you're not seeing the blood, you're not seeing the brutality, you're not seeing the graphic content. So even though there's a lot of crazy stuff going on and airplanes being blown up and people being thrown through you know, windows and things like that, there's definitely a difference between PG-13 and our violence. And that's a tough 
differentiation. But normally what I like to say is if it's brutal um, and it's bloody, uh, those are the two differentiators between PG-13 and R for me. From an outside perspective, the difference between those two is actually the consequence of it. Like, uh, I, I feel like when you're watching like a James Bond movie or if you're watching, um, you know, uh, even a superhero movie, like someone gets punched, they fall down, they disappear. You shoot a bad guy, he falls off, he's gone, he disappears. But then you watch like an Eastern Promises or like you watch uh, uh, another movie that actually shows you the consequences of that violence and the, the, the someone actually desperately trying to breathe or someone actually trying to live through what they've been put through. Uh, then that seems to sort of weigh more towards the R, which is interesting. Yeah, you. I think you you asked and answered your question at the same time, Mike. I think you, you kind of hit it on the button. In Eastern Promises, is it, not only is it more, it's bloodier and it's it seems it's more sinister and there's more tension and sometimes the music in the background is pulsing. There's so many different factors that go into upping the violent category. And it's not just what you're seeing with your eyes. If they have this crazy pounding, you know, music or beat in the background, that's just going to get your heart rate up more. And that's going to just make it that much more intense. So there are a lot of these factors that can really add up. And another one could be if the violence is happening to a child uh, or a teen, as opposed to an evil adult, uh, parents are going to be much more uncomfortable seeing violence to a child compared to violence to the evil character who everybody wants to get stomped on. So <laughs> all these different, uh, you know, issues to deal with when trying to figure out the categories. Which is an interesting thing too, because then if you start to talk, and this is a bigger conversation, but if you start to talk about the responsibility of a filmmaker and you start to talk about the responsibility of, of actually introducing to young folks um, violence without consequence, then there's, uh, like, I'm sure that there's a whole study that's done on, on psychologically how that affects folks, where it's like, okay, there isn't a repercussion of violence, there isn't a voice behind how it happens. So I find myself as a director oftentimes feeling the responsibility and actually enjoying the responsibility of creating a, a situation in which there's a result to a character's actions. Um, but I feel like if I do that when it comes to violence, then obviously I'm playing in the rated art territory. <laughs> right, absolutely. And, you know, there are two schools of thought, obviously. Yeah, and there are a lot of college studies on if violence in movies is a precursor to violence on the streets. Uh, and, of course, you have video games, which have, they've upped the ante sure. an incredible amount because they're crazy over the top. Everything's, you know, kids only want to play the mature games. Yeah. Uh, but I think, I think the filmmakers like you, absolutely should take it seriously and should realize that if a kid's going into a theater and he continues to see the glamorous guy who does all the shooting and he makes all the money and sells all the drugs and has got this great life, uh, there's got to be some kind of personal accountability with each and every filmmaker. And quite frankly, I don't see it all that much. Well, because it's, dude, I mean, the only reason why there's a conflict, I think, essentially between a filmmaker and the MPAA is the money. So at the, at the end of the day, myself as a director, I couldn't care less. So like if I make a film that is brutal and bloody and, bloody and very honest and, and has a lot of really sort of adult themes that I'm tackling because I, as an adult, I'm going through these stories and basically as a filmmaker, you're just a storyteller and you're, you're trying to express experiences that you may have or you're trying to deal with stuff that's happening to you i i'm not trying to to funnel that down to kids so from a directorial standpoint i don't think that a lot of the stuff that i talk about in my movies is something that a five-year-old that a 12-year-old that a 13-year-old should digest and the only reason why it matters to me is because in order for me to make these things, they cost a lot of money. And in order for me to go to somebody and say, hey, can you reach into your wallet and pull this stuff out, um, is that there's accountability with money. And so these folks will sit there and go, okay, we gotta, you got to fill the seats because we got to make our returns on this and we have to make what we've projected the, uh, our income to be. And so then that becomes that 
that conflict. Because then as a storyteller, you're trying to tell an honest story and you're trying to create the stuff. Even before you get into the rating game, you're, you're dealing with executives and their opinions and their polls and what the audience, what they think the audience wants, which is based upon what the audience actually goes and buys. So they're That's sitting right. there going like, hey, look, we want violence. We want all these different elements. So it's a fascinating, I, as, a, as a filmmaker, I've never had a beef with the MPAA and I understand why they exist. It's just the beef sort of comes in when, uh, in order for me to tell my story, I need money from somebody, <laughs> and that person is like, "Look, we got to fill seats, so you got to scrap this and this and this and this." You know? That's right, Mike. And every every movie that I've ever been involved with came down to money. It's you need money to be able to make the film. You need money to be able to put seats in the, you know, put uh, put bodies in the seats. It's uh, I just don't see any way around it is even some of the top filmmakers that have final cut they still have difficulty making a film because it is uh except all but the handful of top uh producers and directors it's it all comes down to money it's got to be a fascinating it's got to be a, a a really intense amount of pressure that is often put on the MPAA, not only from the filmmakers and, and that, but do you guys get a lot of uh, feedback from families and from, from viewers? Uh, well, the Raiders, the Raiders on the board hear about it from the chairman uh, if there were a lot of complaints. Uh, and parents have the ability to be able to uh, uh, send an email to the MPAA or call the MPAA if they don't agree with the film, if they feel strongly that there was – a film that was way off base and that their little Joey was subjected to something they didn't expect, then I think it's, it's smart of them to make the phone call because um, they will listen and they'll listen. If there's a lot of complaints, they'll listen even more. Uh, so yeah, I, th th there's a way to do it as far as just a few people doing it. I don't know how it resonates, but there have been films where, Quite a few people complained, and uh, they took note of it, and that could change the way a future movie's rated because they're told that they were way off on that movie because of this, this, and this. And fascinating. And then once a rating is officially passed, that rating can't be changed by you guys, right? That's that's correct. Interesting. And actually, when you say you guys, I'm honored, but I'm I've been <laughs> out of the MPAA for three years. I appreciate. That. I just I want to make it clear that. And I no longer work for the MPAA. Sometimes when I represent a filmmaker, I'll, I'll deal with them. Um, but my whole allegiance at this, uh, at this stage of my career is to uh, my clients who are mostly producers uh, and script writers and film guarantors. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a god-awful podcast host, so that's my fault. <laughs> You're fantastic. That's, I'll take it as a compliment, okay? <laughs> um, okay, well, so I think we've discussed a lot of really interesting, like, honestly, this is the first time that you and I have talked about this stuff, and my eyes have really been open to how it works because, you know, you read this stuff online and you look, you hunt for uh, an accurate portrayal of who these folks are. And, and I think sometimes a lot of this that I read is a negative thing because... There are filmmakers or producers that are just really upset with the fact that the rating is going to affect their income. Um, so it's it's. I'm happy that you were actually able to talk me through this because I can now understand it as how you guys do it, how the job works. That's cool to me. Hey, Mike, one other thing that might be interesting uh, for the listeners, if they do, if they are kind of interested in the rating system, there was a film out in 2006 called "This Film Is Not Yet Rated." Yes. And that was a documentary. I was on the board when the film came out. That was a documentary by uh, Kirby Dick. It's been on Netflix. I'm not sure if it's on now, but it's probably on one of the streaming uh, stations. And it's well worth a view. I mean, I think it's kind of uh, it, it's kind of a hatchet job on the MPAA, but it does bring up some hot, hot button items and it talks about some of the the system failures. Uh, obviously, it was kind of extreme in its. Uh, dislike of the system uh but it's it's well worth a watch yeah i had seen i had, i think i had seen part of it it was an interesting thing and i'm going to watch the whole thing again um because i'm just completely fascinated and, and and part of my job as a director is that i have to 
try for myself, I try to make it so that I can learn all these different steps and just be fully aware of stuff because there's always a surprise. And when you, when you get thrown into the mix and someone finally green lights your ability to make something, you're playing catch up. Um, and I hate these like weird little surprises on like, okay, we got to get the film rated. Well, what does that mean? Oh my God, that takes three months. Oh wow. Okay. Like how do we process this? And like, all right, how many, how many fucks am I allowed to say in this? Okay, great. You know? Um, so it's been interesting. It's kind of the reason why I wanted to get you on the show. Cause I, I never even thought about it. Um, and so I really appreciate you sitting and chatting with us. My pleasure, Mike. And you know, one thing I will, another thing that I'll say, and it's funny because, you know, it's interesting to you. It's interesting to a lot of people and it's great, you know, party cocktail conversation. But uh, one thing I will say, and I talk to, uh, to young filmmakers at schools out here in L.A. mostly, I say you just never know when a piece of knowledge can come in handy because you may be working on independent films for the next 10 years. But what happens if you find yourself on a set and they have a question about ratings and you just happen to know something about it that nobody else knows or you know somebody to call you have a resource to be able to turn to there are so many other niche categories in addition to ratings but like i've told all these these aspiring filmmakers knowledge can never hurt and it's amazing that one little tidbit that you learn uh by being interested and by you know spending a little more time learning about the industry it, you have no idea how it can help you in the future So thanks for listening, guys. I hope you learned something on this episode. I genuinely feel like I have a better understanding of how the rating board works. Thanks for putting up with all my technical problems today. I promise to do better next week or next episode. Maybe it'll be next week. Maybe it won't. What are you going to do about it? I just want to remind you guys to follow us on Instagram at in love with the process pod. That's in love with the process pod. Uh, we've been growing and followers all month. I've been trying to post some really cool behind the scenes stuff, some really cool, interesting stuff with photography and actors. Um, it's actually become sort of like an inspirational posting for me because I find the stuff that I really like and put it all in one spot and then we all get to talk about it. Um, also be sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or SoundCloud. I'm working to make sure we're listed on other providers, but just make sure you do a search for us on your favorite. And if we don't show up, leave me a note on Instagram and say, hey, get your shit together. Get yourself listed on this one. All right. Um, I'm also really excited to announce that I did an episode of the Film Riot podcast with host Ryan Conley. Awesome dude. Really cool guy. And I was really excited about this one because I've been a big fan of their stuff at Film Riot for years now. Um, so it was really cool to be able to go on there and talk about 12 cam. I go into detail on how we pitched the film to major Hollywood producers. It's a rad episode. He's a really cool guy. It's a fun podcast. So I'll share the link below. Definitely check it out. Um, so I've got a bunch more shows coming out. Uh, I got some really interesting guests on the way. I don't want to talk about them yet because I feel like if I talk about it, I lose them. So keep your fingers crossed. And thanks for listening to In Love With The Process. 